Though we wish it were otherwise, long-running video game franchises often lose their way and forget just exactly why they've been so popular. Pac-Man used to be a simple maze-based collect-a-thon navigator that has since been turned into a third-person 3D platformer. Resident Evil used to be the go-to series for survival horror, and now it's simply an action-focused gore shooter. And even The Lord of the Rings, best identified as a third-person hack-and-slash series in video game form by anyone with a brain, became what it shouldn't have been. For this one series, though, it appears that its time may have finally come again. Middle-Earth Shadow of Mordor looks to finally provide some much-needed course correction. Developed by Monolith Productions, this title arrives at a time in which the developer could really use a strong release, as its resume has been less than spectacular over the past six years. With it having been over a decade since the last proper Lord of the Rings romp, can Monolith both recapture the classic fun that was the early 2000s titles and restore the crushed faith fans of the developer once had when they were making new IPs like Fear and Condemned? For two and a half millennia, the Rangers of Gondor have stood watch at the Black Gate that separates their lands from the haunted realm of Mordor, the site of Dark Lord Sauron's eventual resurrection. Sometime prior to the events of the Lord of the Rings, the Rangers have grown complacent in their duties, and it costs them one dark, stormy night as a horde of orcs known as Uruks invade. The Black Gate is lost, and Talion, one of the Rangers, is executed along with his wife and son in a sacrificial ritual. Talion awakens in another world, where he meets a nameless wraith who informs him of his untimely fate. Instead of being allowed to venture into the unknown alongside his family, Talion is instead banished from death and has become bound to the wraith, cursing him to walk Middle-earth forever. With Sauron's power growing and the fate of the world in the balance, Talion and the wraith set out to stop the Auric forces and break the curse, allowing him to reunite with his family in death. Talion's journey to take revenge upon the forces of darkness and rid himself of his curse wants to be a great experience. Thanks to the inclusion of the Wraith, for whom won't be named due to spoilers, the game becomes an interesting buddy cop title with Talion, the less than level head swordsman, teaming up with the wise, forward thinking Wraith. The dynamic between the two characters is one of caution, tempered trust, and determination, as the two must join forces to achieve each of their own ends. The characters themselves are well written, well acted, and worthy of your attention. If anything, they are the best part of the game's story. That being said, the narrative of Middle-earth Shadow of Mordor suffers from several distinct problems. The first of these, and easily the most notable, is pacing. Talion's tale is one fraught with a mix of slow and fast pacing with nary a moment to be found in between within the confines of the main storyline. One minute you're discovering clues to your companion's background, the next you're taking on a mid-game boss with little to no pomp or circumstance leading up to the fight. Events in the game simply happen at times without prior warning or build-up. The game takes on a two-act structure and ends well before it should and does not conclude with any significant resolution at all. This production could have benefited greatly from having a third act, but this is for naught. Pacing is one issue that can be tolerated, but having underdeveloped characters is something that shouldn't happen in a good story, and it is here that Shadow of Mordor has another misstep. Inside the 20 mission story, our hero encounters new characters whose arcs are either short-lived or significantly underdeveloped, making you wonder just exactly how much they contributed to the overall plot and whether or not they were worth including along for the ride. Extending the length of the supporting cast roles in the game, or even simply having them all together to play a significant part in the final moments of the story, would have been a much better plan, but sadly this never happens. Apart from the length of the characters' stories, the game is hurt by just how much it panders to the player. At many turns, the game recycles plot elements or purposefully mentions or introduces some character that is significant to the events of The Lord of the Rings without really establishing why they really matter to the overall storyline, instead serving as gameplay vessels by which to further the plot along. Nowhere is this more evident than in the game's inclusion of Gollum early on. Gollum only serves to give the Wraith character more significance than is initially presented, and appears only for a couple missions before outright disappearing until the in-game sequence. 
This feels very shoehorned in and unnecessary to the continued development of the story and is, in this reviewer's opinion, only there because the developer wanted to lend credence to the plot. Aside from these issues, Shadow of Mordor just isn't a well-told story. While our Wraith Companion is fleshed out, Talion really isn't, and you are forced to visit the game's appendices to learn more about the man he is, as is the case for many of the game's characters and subplots. The game concludes with a lackluster final battle, the nature of which mirrors many of the less than stellar compromises many notorious games over the years have concluded on. On top of that, Shadow of Mordor's sequel mongers like it's nobody's business, all but outright demanding that a second game be created so that Talion's story can receive a proper conclusion. I sternly believe that Monolith is capable of building a compelling story, but, at least for me, this one's a little half-baked. From a narrative viewpoint, Middle Earth has some significant problems that will hopefully be addressed in the future. From a gameplay standpoint, however, the production contains some rather enticing design elements. Though there are some significant flaws to be found, the gameplay department is where Middle Earth finds its stride. As has been the case for smart developers wanting to create a strong combat system, Shadow of Mordor borrows heavily from the brawler system created by Rocksteady Studios for the Batman Arkham series. As Talion, players will face off against anywhere between one to a couple dozen Uruk enemies that plague the land at any given time. Players can use their sword to engage the enemy and earn combos through time strikes and careful dodges, the latter of which are telegraphed to the player by way of a button prompt. As your combo meter grows, the players allow the opportunity to execute finishers that can instantly kill normal enemies, as well as other abilities such as area of effect stuns. There's almost nothing to complain about here, and should be regarded as the high point of Shadow of Mordor. Monolith also chose to include a stealth system derived from the aforementioned series that does well to complement both the combat and the open world structure of the game. Players can enter a stealth state by pulling and holding the right trigger, causing Talion to crouch down and conceal himself significantly more. Talion can also take cover from behind corners and within foliage, and attract enemies to him for easy one-hit kills. The system is also fairly forgiving as orcs have a very limited field of vision and take several seconds to react to actually seeing the player, allowing you precious time to correct your mistake and take down the enemy. Thanks to the curse that binds Talion to his wraith companion, our hero is endowed with supernatural powers by which he can press the advantage against Sauron's forces. The player will progressively earn many of their skills through graded story missions that greatly increase your power both from a stealth and combat perspective. One fantastically satisfying ability called Shadow Strike allows you to target an enemy from a distance and warp to their location in an instant, similar to a Vanguard in the Mass Effect series, allowing you to potentially deliver a killing blow to it depending on how much you upgrade that ability. At the heart of Talion's Wraith Arsenal powers though is the much publicized Branding ability a key power that plays a pivotal role in the game's story. Players eventually earn the ability to brand an enemy, orc or otherwise, and convert them to your side. This mechanic, while taking more time than it would to deliver a typical death blow upon them, is tremendously satisfying and can be of great strategic help if you find yourself up against a boss or trapped in a particularly hairy situation. Shadow of Mourner's most touted feature is the Nemesis system. A detailed attempt at providing a command structure to provide depth to both Sauron's army as well as orc society. War chiefs sit at the top of the pyramid while captains vie for power by competing various actions that occur randomly over time as you continue on in the game, including, but not limited to, follower recruitment, duels with other captains, trials of ordeal, and feasts to celebrate their prestige. All these events will appear dynamically with each respawn, and can be interacted with or invaded to a degree of success or failure depending on the player's skill. Each member of the Nemesis system features a randomized assortment of strengths and weaknesses the player must be wary of or take advantage of, respectfully, if they wish to kill or manipulate their rank in the chain of command. Success will result in them either fleeing and stunting their rise through the ranks, or even outright eliminating them from the pool of contenders. Killed enemies will drop runes that passively enhance Talion's abilities, but whose level and significance are determined by the victim's power and stats in orc society. Succeeding in combat against Uruk Captain or Warchief is a satisfying accomplishment at almost every turn, but it is when you utilize branding upon them that you really begin to see the potential of the Nemesis system. Trading out the rune reward for gaining an ally, you can command your newly acquired ranked minion to perform feats listed previously as well as have them engage in power struggles against other orcs raising their power, and thus making them a more potent ally. 
these two systems, when used in conjunction with one another, are smartly done, and it will be one of the more common actions you'll take in the late game. The dynamics of the Nemesis system are thus widely varied and well thought out, making it a highlight of the Shadow of Mordor experience. With a few caveats, Mondolith has something to be proud of here. That being said, Middle Earth does contain a litany of questionable design choices and overlooked items that will need to be addressed when the game receives its inevitable sequel. For me, the gameplay structure of earning abilities is a big problem. As stated before, the most significant powers are gated behind story missions and cannot be earned beforehand. This would normally not be a problem for me had Monolith decided to allow the player more time to use Talion's full arsenal from a much earlier standpoint in the game. But as the current product stands, you only have access to all of the abilities once you've completed three quarters of the core storyline itself. Branding, the most marketed ability featured in the game that paradigm shifts the combat and nemesis systems, only comes into play over two thirds of the way through the story missions, which is very disappointing. The developer would have been much better off had players been at least given the branding several missions beforehand, preferably just after you move on to the second and final area of the game. Combat of the last third of the game doesn't seem to attend to the branding system either, and it is here that I found myself becoming more than a little annoyed. Since players have the ability to kill any branded orc companions at any time, the combat system doesn't seem to make the distinction between who is branded and who is not. Therefore, in many skirmishes in which I have large numbers of both regular and converted orcs engaged in combat alongside me, the combat system will not target enemy orcs over branded ones, instead allowing me to strike my allies when I'm really trying to attack my enemies. It can be incredibly frustrating to end up killing my allies instead of my foes mid-battle, especially when you are forced to contend with captains or chiefs. Other smaller items eat at me as well, though none more than what I have thus far described. Completing side quests do not yield any stat buffs or character augmentations. Orc society itself seems very underdeveloped, and seems fixated on the tropes of them wanting to gain power, enslaving humans, and serving Sauron when there simply must be more than that for an entire race. There isn't much to explore in either region. There isn't even a New Game Plus feature. Overall, as great as the combat, stealth, and nemesis systems are, the game has quite a few flaws that can drag down the experience. Middle-Earth's Shadow of Mordor spent four years in development behind the scenes at Monolith Productions, and the effort has clearly paid off in terms of production value. The developer has done a rather fantastic job of recreating and implementing the world and character design Peter Jackson and Waiter Workshop have made over the past decade and a half. Nowhere is the depth of the production work made more apparent than when you take a look at the writing and voice work. The writing team did a phenomenal job here, creating dialogue that feels embedded in the universe for the main cast, supporting characters, and even random enemies. This was no doubt aided greatly by Monolith's decision to have Christian Condomessa, the lead writer of Red Dead Redemption, be in charge of writing this game. Though I have aforementioned qualms about Shadow of Mordor's story progression and character usage, I never got tired of learning more about the world, the events, or the characters contained within. Monolith's casting choices exemplify the story presentation here. Troy Baker continues his winning streak as Talion, with a wide range of emotions to be found in the character's arc. Veteran actor Alastair Duncan does a great job as Talion's wraith companion. Even Gollum is well done, as Liam O'Brien does a rather excellent job emulating Andy Serkis' presentation of the character. In terms of production, you have to hand it to the developer. They did a rather fantastic job making this the most authentic Tolkien video game to date. When you get right down to it, there's no denying that Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor is a great game. Thanks to hard work on the part of a veteran developer willing to take an existing franchise in a new direction, we have been presented with the most successful reconsideration of a Tolkien product to date. The characters feel authentic. The gameplay is very well designed. The player feels exceptionally empowered. The world feels ripped straight out of the films. It's a great Tolkien experience. Middle Earth is a very fun game to play, though it does contain within it some distinct problems, both narratively and gameplay wise, that should be addressed once Monolith begins work on a sequel. Despite these flaws, it's more than worthy of investing your time in, and should definitely be on your must play list in 2014 if you're an action adventure fan.